for the time. So be sure to grab your tea, grab a seat, and tune in to Miss Liz. Tea time, making a difference. One cup at a time. Well, welcome back to Tea Time with Miss Liz. That's right. I am back for the evening tea time. And Miss Liz has got some little glitchy fingers today. I'm not sure what's going on. I want to go put the video in and I'm taking it off and I'm putting it on. So that's why we have a cute little glitch at the beginning. Uh, just to add some little entertainment for all of you guys to enjoy. So right now I have the incredible Patty Townley convert in the back sitting in the studio. And we're going to be talking about truth and she just told me how to say it epiphany and adopt that's her tea and we're going to get that out there so before we get you to enjoy the, tonight's tea time we're going to get you over to miss liz's youtube channel and miss liz's podcast apps uh tea time with miss liz and give that a quick follow and subscribe and all that good stuff and you can listen to all these tea times at any time in the morning afternoon evening in your car in your home and uh Wherever you are, you can enjoy all of these incredible tea times. There is over 300 plus tea times that you can enjoy that are filled with 105 plus topics as well. So if one tea time doesn't resonate, the next one will. I guarantee you that. So before we get started, we're going to do the disclaimer bio and we're going to we're going we're gonna to spill some tea, Miss Liz style with some storytelling and some words tonight with all of you guys. Disclaimer for Miss Liz's tea time, Miss Liz. Miss Liz's tea time live show. Miss Liz is having glitches even in what we're speaking. Miss Liz is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any tea time show hosted by myself, Miss Liz, is always brought forward in good faith. However, may bring forward dialogues and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the giving time of airing. All tea time guests and audience participants are responsible for using their good judgment and taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward for any the content brought forward may include discussions for some where they may be emotionally at risk. It is significant to know that the show is engaging in discussion forms only to offer and inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutic advice. If you have any questions about the disclaimer or the panelist discussion, you may freely contact me. Miss Liz through my email at bookingmissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in today's show in any aspect, I myself, Miss Liz, welcomes you. And should you decide that the show is not made for you at this time, I respect those wishes and will see you at a later show at a later date and time. And again, all tea time shows are done on Thursday, 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If it's a surprise, rescheduled, or special tea time, you'll see that on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So Miss Liz is here all the time. Uh, so now a little bit on Patty. Well, I've been following Patty for years and I finally got her book and I was like, well, I, might, I need to get her as a guest. So that's why Patty's here because I reached out and said, Patty, I have your book. Now I need you as a guest. So Patty Towns, Town, Townley Convert wrote her first book, her first book in first grade. Since then, she's been published in numerous books, journals and magazines. Creative nonfiction helps her paint word pictures that make even dry academic subjects matters more engaging. Her outstanding ability to simplify complex concepts gives the audience the satisfaction of comprehending difficult topics. And for more dramatic subject matters, Patty's storytelling ability captivates readers. An award-winning freelance writer and editor, Patty Townley Convert, is the author of The Windblown Girl. A memoir about self, sexuality, and social. Her young adults trying to escape life's pain infuse this page turner with a message relevant for today. Patty's written numerous magazine articles for national and international publications such as Life Beautiful, High, High V, Facts, and Trends. As a founder member of the anti-human trafficking organization, Everyone's Free, Patty co-wrote Do One Thing, enlisting in the battle against human trafficking. Most of her research and writing focuses on justice issues. Her bi-weekly blogs focus on self, sexuality, and social issues. 
For almost a decade, Patty coached NASA level scientists on their writing skills and edited books showing how the sci scientific facts support a creator. Patty's done the limbo in the Caribbean, gone on a king crab safari and in the Arctic Circle and will explore Dem Denali, I think I'm saying it right, National Park this summer. While at home, she plants pansies and experiments with drought tolerant gardening. So let me get Patty in here and let's have some tea. Welcome, Patty. Hi, Miss Liz. Great to be here. <laughs> well, you know, I've been following you for a long time, like I said, and I'm just happy to have you here and get to meet you in person through the virtual land, right? Well, and I'm thrilled to be here. Your um, uh, tea podcast is just brilliant. I think what a great way to interact, to have our tea. Right. It's a different style of tea. We're serving different tea in this house. Yeah. And it's a great tea. So Patty, I'm going to take you way back. So who was Patty as a little girl and who's Patty now? You know, Patty as a little girl was pretty shy, um, but I kind of had some spunk and I was a pretty happy kid. And then my parents got divorced and that kind of changed my world. I um, craved attention from a guy. My dad traveled a lot. He actually worked in New Mexico even before my parents divorced. Uh, he worked as a private pilot in New Mexico. And so he came home and he was kind of the Disneyland dad. Very fun. We all adored him. Uh, I have four sisters and they all thought that each one of them thought they were his favorite. I knew I wasn't because I was kind of a bookish kid. I liked to read. I liked to think about things. And my dad was just a barrel of fun. I was not that fun person. And I wanted to be. And as I got a little bit older and in high school, I uh, made that more important than learning. I didn't, I did okay in high school, but Academics was certainly not my focus. I was much more interested in dating and boys and um, that kind of thing. Well, I, I think I, some of us girls were like that, right? Where we we craved that boy's attention. We like to chase the boys, the bad boys, right? The cowboys. Right. It was the bad boys. And, you know, my parents divorced really impacted me. All I wanted was parents that were together and stayed home. I wanted an intact family. And that's what I went into my young adulthood with was that craving of a husband who came home at night and who loved me and wouldn't leave me and would be there for our children. That was not what I got. So, Patty, do you want to tell us what you did get? Well, my life took some very strange turns. Um, I was conservative by nature, just in my heart. Like I said, I was kind of shy. And I started at my mar I was married at 19, and I thought he loved me more than I did him, and that would make it safe. And I wanted safety. I wanted security. But I was really miserable because he had some very different views from me and did not treat me well emotionally. Um, I was really hungry for something better. I didn't like my job. I worked for my mother as a receptionist and it was boring. Same thing day after day. My mom owned the company. My sister ran it and there was no real room for me and i was a writer at heart but i didn't know how to do that i didn't know i could do that i was really stuck my mom wanted me to go on the caribbean cruise with her she was single and fun she was in her 40s and i was 21 i think the first time i went i didn't think my husband would let me go because he was very controlling but he was glad to have me gone and so I went on a cruise and it was like I'd died and gone to heaven. 
back then young girls didn't go on cruises. It was mostly older people with a lot of money. And I certainly didn't fit that perspective, but the men on the ship, the men that worked there treated me like gold. And I got to know a man who was the second in command. The first two cruises, we became friends and we, we just had such a great time. He met us every night for dinner. The officers uh, went in the dining room back then. And I actually got to see him perform a rescue at sea. That's in my book. And the third cruise, he did not go. And on the way to the third cruise, my mom said it was too bad he wouldn't be there because I should have an affair. She knew I wasn't happy. And I said, I'm not having an affair. And she wondered why I was such a prude. Well, then I met a very sexy Norwegian navigator, uh, an international playboy. And I thought, this guy is trouble. But he drew me like a magnet. And long story short, and this doesn't really, this comes out right away in the book. Um, I decided to do what young people are doing today. And that was to have a no strings attached affair. My husband would never know. We were in a different world on the ship and I thought I could control my emotions. Well, I learned that sexuality is not something that we can control. If we do try to control our emotions, we impact intimacy. And that can be just as dangerous as getting entangled in an emotional involvement that we can't control. Uh, this fellow, his name was Jan, and he told me from the beginning, he said, don't fall in love with me. And I laughed and I said, there is no way. He was, I knew he was not somebody I could ever have a life with. I knew that from the beginning. And I mean, he worked in the Caribbean. He was from Norway. He took his vacations in Spain. He was just out of my league. And so I didn't want to get emotionally involved, but I did. And I can, it, I don't know if there's time I could read a little excerpt from my book that kind of. Absolutely. I'm just going to hold the book up so people can see what book we're talking about. That's great. Um, yeah, there was a scene in the book that really describes the dilemma. The other thing that was going on was my dad was a missing was missing in action in Vietnam. We knew that if he'd been captured, he would be tortured. And to know your dad, who we like I said, we adored him. I adored him. I knew I wasn't his favorite, but I adored him. We all did. And we didn't know whether he was alive. Um that stayed the case for a long time. And so I was a pretty unhappy girl, except on the ship. And uh, so I got involved with this guy. And this is the passage that kind of tells a little bit about the story without giving too much away. My husband had called me on the ship to see if I wanted him to leave. And it made me angry because he interrupted my fantasy um, I had to deal with reality and I couldn't tell him on the phone that, no, I didn't want him to be there. I just couldn't do it. We had a little boy. I did. I wanted an intact family for my son. I didn't want a divorce. I really wanted my marriage to work, but I didn't know how to make that happen. So after the phone call, uh, Jan was working. He worked uh, eight to 12 uh morning and night. So we had the afternoons to have fun. He would work until midnight, come back and work till midnight while I had time with my mom. And then we would have late nights together. Um, so after the phone call, I said, wanting to be alone, I went downstairs, pushed open a heavy door and stepped outside into the oppressive evening air. Finding an isolated, isolated spot by the pool, I perched on the edge of a chase lounge and rubbed my throbbing temples. What am I going to do? How can I possibly make my marriage work? And what about Jan? This was the decade of me. I had abandoned all the rules to learn about myself. With no responsibilities, I thought I could be whoever I wanted for two full weeks. Despite knowing that the sensations of lovemaking, intimacy, and respectful interactions could only be temporary, I'd taken that risk thinking no one outside this oceanic realm would ever know. But how could I possibly put Jan in the past? 
though it was clear I must not fall in love, I was crazy about him. Yet those emotions couldn't be any more than temporary. If he knew how I felt, the relationship would be over. I simply must not, could not fall in love. And what about the family I longed for? He was not an option. Jan's highest priorities involved his career and seeking pleasure. Mine were diametrically opposed, stability with a family and conventional routines. He loved his glacial homeland. I loved Southern California's warmth. He constantly made new friends and went on adventures in exotic locations. He spent vacations in Spain with his best friend. All I wanted was security, a home and a husband who would come home at night and be there for my son. The cruise had put me on my own personal Titanic, an emotional ship destined to sink. My mind and body had connected in ways I never before experienced. Yet that problem was mine alone. Others had casual sex. Why couldn't I? At least this time, my feelings weren't wrecking the relationship. Although I had a hard time not revealing how much I adored Jan, knowing our relationship couldn't continue made me seem as elusive as he was. Craving a life with someone like him was out of the question, but how could I live without him? The muggy night silence wrapped me in a thick blanket of despair. Knowing what was at stake, I leaned back to look up at turbulent storm clouds with glimpses of the moons peeking through. A gentle breeze parted them enough to reveal patches of a night sky, spangled with the brilliance of diamonds tossed on a black jeweler's cloth. It would take someone big enough to hang those stars in the sky to fix this mess. Right, I laughed ruefully. Even if such a creator existed, why would he help someone like me? I left my little boy to go on a Caribbean cruise. I cheated on my husband. Worst of all, I didn't even feel guilty. And I was crazy about a man I must not fall in love with. This situation was beyond any power I had to control it. For a moment, I sensed an unseen presence, one that understood and cared about the mess I made a mess far too big for me to clean it up. Maybe that was wishful thinking. This was only the tip of an iceberg that lay straight ahead. And no matter what, I had to stay in the truth. My relationship with Jan would soon be over. The truth, that's the night the truth became incredibly important to me. I knew I could not go into denial. So Patty, how long did that affair last? Um, you know, our hearts became entangled. It wasn't only me. Um, the cruise did it did not end with the cruise. Um, it lasted. It lasted long after. And in terms of emotional entanglement, I would say it will probably never end in this lifetime. We really fell in love, uh, and that's where the story takes on different dimensions. And I had to learn about truth. That was reality. That was hard, really hard. Um, and as I got to the, I turned, actually, I turned to our creator, Jesus Christ. I, uh, became a Christian. And after I became a Christian, I had to end the relationship. And I thought I would die in the process. And it only got harder after that. You think that we make certain decisions and it's going to solve problems. Well, new ones often appear. And I learned that it takes someone bigger than me to help me with those problems. That's where Epiphany. So Patty, did he fall in love with you too? He did. He did. It took 12 years before I knew. Um, but eventually... I found out and I was married again for a second time and, and in another difficult marriage. I just came from, well, let's put it this way. I think many, many of your listeners might relate to this, that sometimes our upbringing makes us feel like we fell in a ditch and we're not healthy and we don't know how to get there. And it's climbing out of the ditch and making different choices. And that's where the epiphanies came in as I started to follow Christ and learn biblical concepts that don't change. The problem is we operate on um, cultural lies quite often. 
that we'll find our Prince Charming, that uh, we deserve pleasure, that we can follow our heart. Um, and yet the Bible says that the heart's wicked and that, you know, we have a, a part of us that cheats on our husbands or tells lies or um, we're dishonest with ourselves, And that's what leads to things like addictions. Um, it led me in a way to an addiction toward men where I thought a man would solve my problems. And a man couldn't solve my problems. I met the man who had it all. He was good looking and super smart. He spoke five languages and he genuinely cared about me. And he treated me so well in many respects, but he also drank too much. He was a partier. He had access to lots of women. Um, I had to weigh out what was for my best good, and it took staying in the truth to do that. And there are absolute truths. Our society tells us that truth is relative. But for instance, here's one. We all die. That's true. Um, the bank is either open or closed. That's a true statement. Um, so there is absolute truth. And when we start applying that to our lives, we start having epiphanies over what's good, what's healthy, what makes us really happy and gives us peace. And that's what I found when I finally stopped making choices, even though it was hard and I thought it would kill me. I did. I, there was a night where I thought I would die because I had the option of leaving reality behind and living a fantasy. And by God's grace, I made the right choice and it hurt more than I can ever describe. Well, they say real love does hurt, right? It does. You know, if you really love someone, you want the best for them. And that impacted how I ended up raising my sons is that I stayed in the truth when some parents get into denial and enable their children to have bad patterns that uh, hurt them. And I was able to, by God's grace, speak the truth in love. And then it was their choice how they handled that. Well, there and there was two things in your book that really pulled to me. And it's the phrase escaping the pain and embracing the pain. It's part of the part one and part two of the book. But it really pulled me in. And I and I was like, I need to ask Patty about this. So what does escaping the pain mean for you, Patty? You know, that's what I did when I embarked on that affair is I was escaping the pain. I wanted to feel, I wanted to feel better. I was hurting and Jan made me feel better, you know, for a little while, even though I knew it was wrong, even though I knew it would hurt me in the end, I had no idea it would hurt others. Um, and I did my best to keep that from happening there wasn't this out and out, oh, you've had an affair and this whole big blow up or things that you might think would happen. But over time, I realized that our lives were out of control. And by trying to escape the pain, some people do that with alcohol. Some people do it. I was doing it with an illicit love affair. And uh, then when I came, when I became a Christian, I embraced the pain and I said, okay, this is suffering and it hurts. It hurts really, really bad. But if I want my life to change, I can't do it my way anymore. I have to adopt new standards. That's where the adopt comes in is that I adopted biblical standards. And even when it hurt or cost me, there, there was a time when um, I could have had extra money, quite a bit of extra money and from my mother and i had to tell her no it's wrong i'm not going to do that and she proceeded to tell me how stupid i was and and it hurt because i loved my mom i wanted her approval but i decided that it didn't matter what others thought 
I was going to do the right thing instead of doing what, what felt good. What felt good might have eased my pain for a moment, but it wouldn't satisfy me inside or give me peace. And as a result of the choices that I adopted, I've got peace, I've got stability, I've got a family that's very different than I expected, but um, I'm ha I wouldn't trade it for anything. Well, I think that's our stories, right? That's our tease. You know, you had to go through it in order to understand yourself, right? Because it comes back to yourself understanding who you were, Patty, right? right. And and, that, and that's what you talk about is self-love. You had to learn what you thought it was men that, that would satisfy, bring that love. And a lot of us girls who have, uh, you know, who have gone through an upbringing like divorce and stuff, and daddies and all of that. I myself, when I was younger, I was the same way, Patty. I thought, okay, if I got it from the boys, then I, you know, I'm a, I'm loved. But it it has a lot to do with the upbringing, and has a lot to do with, the, you know, seeking that love that we don't get as a child. It really does. And the story about Jan and about my dad, my dad's story as a pilot for Air America. He didn't. He wasn't in the service. He worked for a company that was contracted to the CIA. It's a pretty dramatic story. And my dad's story actually impacted my relationship with Jan in ways I never imagined. And it was when I was writing the book that those pieces started coming into place. And I realized that it was when I became a Christian and I found my identity. And this is about self, like you were talking about. When I found my identity, my true identity, it changed everything because then I could stay true to myself because I knew who I was. And that was, I was a child of God. I had enormous potential that I didn't even know I had. I finally started writing because I had a story worth telling. And I didn't start writing until I was in my late thirties. Um, a friend told me, if you'll go to a writer's conference, I'll pay for it because your story needs to be told. And her belief in me helped me believe in myself. And so I started that long journey, which turned into an incredible career. I think about how I sat on that uh, chase lounge out by the pool on the cruise ship and looked at the stars in the sky and thought about a creator hanging them in the sky. And Years later, I end up working with NASA level scientists who could tell how God put those stars in the sky. That to, I couldn't have ever uh, planned that or orchestrated it. It happened in a way that I still am in awe when I think about it because I was desperate for a job, didn't want to work with scientists, but it paid really well and I needed the money. And it ended up being the greatest job I could have ever wanted. Well, that's how life works, right? Life, yeah. life, brings, life brings us these miracles or, you know, these opportunities. And we're like, I, I don't know why I'm here. Like, why, why, why are you putting me here for? And then years later, you're looking back and you're like, wow, that was amazing. Thank you for putting me there. Our, when we find our purpose, and this is part of our identity is finding our purpose, what we're created to do. And I was hardwired to write. And uh, it's, it's where I'm, I'm really happy when I'm writing and I get to express myself and I have things worth saying. And I never imagined that it would take the direction it did for so long as nonfiction. And now I'm taking that and turning it into fiction, which is very fun. And my life is never dull. I think some people go from day to day and live in shades of gray. You'll, you'll see this in my next e-newsletter is we can live a technicolor life if we're looking in the right place. It's vibrant. It's fun. It's exciting because we have purpose, but we never know what's going to happen next. And it becomes just this incredible journey that has eternal consequences. Absolutely. And before we went live, we talked about sexuality because I had said, oh, 
It's a good thing I, I checked out the book because I honestly thought it was something different. And thank goodness that I took that extra few minutes to, uh, you know, and look at the book. But I really want to talk about sexuality with you, Patty, because a lot of my listeners, we don't talk about this. We don't talk about the clean intimacy, the connection, the bonding of two individuals. I want to talk to you about how you feel about that and in today's world. You know, I never thought I would be talking about such a thing. Even as I said, I was conservative as a little girl, but I've talked to so many people who have never known intimacy and that sexuality is tied to our identity. So it's very closely tied to ourself. And when we come to know who we are, who we were created to be, it gives us dignity. And when we bring that dignity into our sexuality, and this is going to be a little bit shocking, probably I've never quite put it like this, but I didn't have that dignity in my marriage. I was uh, not appreciated for who I was. I couldn't talk about things that were important to me. He wanted to me to be a sex object and I wasn't And it. And it, it was kind of awful. And then when I met Jan, this is backwards and it's wrong. And I know it is, but I also know that my creator loves me no matter what I've done. I know that he brought me to a different place, but it was actually Jan that taught me about the closeness you can feel with a person and the respect that you can have between you, respect for each other's bodies, respect for our minds, uh, uh, an incredible respect. The problem with Jan and I is that we were not married and we had this relationship outside of marriage. And because we both were unhealthy enough, we couldn't be married. And so that impacted us for actual, it impacted us for many, many years uh, after I wrote the book, it has not been as painful to think about or talk about, but I would say even now he's a part of me that I can't escape. I think about him on a daily basis. Um, and that's where people do become one flesh. And if you become one flesh with someone outside of marriage, it's worse than getting pregnant it's worse than getting an STD. It, those things, you know, they eventually work their way out. You, you know, you might have a baby and they may become the, the delight of your life. Um, there's antibiotics to treat STDs. But Jan and I hurt our hearts, he, him as well as me. I did find that out later. That is part of the book. Um, we couldn't make it work. And that's where, when you have that kind of intimacy outside of marriage, it's really dangerous. But inside of marriage, I know many, many, many married couples who have found that. And when you have the same belief system, you have the same values, you have the same goals, and you treat each other with respect, you become closer and closer and uh, bond together as one person. And that's a very true concept very few people find it because they're looking to satisfy themselves in a way that doesn't work. So, so Patty, you, you said you got married twice, correct? I did. I did. Um, I thought the second time was safe too. I was looking for safety. And even though I already was a Christian and I had some validation, actually, I will say this. It was my second marriage that taught me a lot healthier, how to have a healthier perspective. It exposed a lot of lies I told myself. It taught me to speak out where before I was shy and kept things inside. I learned to speak up. It was hard for 18 years. It was very, very hard. Um, but I know that I had to go through that to get where I am now. Sadly, it ended in divorce. I did not want that divorce. 
The first one was my idea and I was determined to walk away from it. The second one, um, even though the marriage was very, very hard, I grieved for two years because I failed. I couldn't make it work. And that was, uh, it's still a sad thing to me. But again, by trusting God, I knew he was in control and had other plans for me that were good. And they were good and they wouldn't have happened. I probably would have never written my book if I had stayed married the second time. So Patty, are you still friends with your second husband? You know, it's interesting because my younger son is a chef and um, we, and he told me one day that he'd never cooked for his dad. And I said, well, we've got to fix that. So we invited his dad and his second wife um, over for dinner. So yes, we're uh, on a good relationship. We're not close, but we, I was able to have them come for dinner and it, it was a success. Well, and, and, and that's what the, a lot of my listeners out there, you know, um, we have our ups and downs, right? In life, some marriages work, some marriages don't. Some relationships are good right from the get-go and some have those bumpy roads. And, you know, Patty, what I, what I really liked about your story and why I've been following you for so many years is because the transparency of your story, it, it, it's real, it's raw, and it's something that people don't talk about, right? We don't talk about affairs. We don't talk about that forbidden love. Um, and it, it's like you said, it's painful when you find a real love and it just doesn't work. You just cannot connect. It It's it's a death in itself. It is. It's it's life is hard. And, you know, life is just hard. I think for every one of us, we have places that um, are hard. And we have choices to make and we can choose to, I, I was telling Miss Liz about this, this series, it's a historical fiction series that I'm working on now called the choice series. And there are voices inside our heads that we listen to voices of anger and jealousy and greed. And if I listened to those voices, I couldn't possibly have had my uh, second husband and his wife over here for dinner. I would have been too focused on all the things that were wrong. But because I have Bible verses speaking inside my head and pastor sermons, and they, we think God is going to be, don't do this, don't do that. But really what he does is he sets us free, free of those voices that are self-destructive and that cause us problems. And that's what gives us stability so that when circumstances are hard, whether it's a cancer diagnosis, a divorce, a loss of a job, whatever it might be, when we look at a great God who loves us and is good, he will always uh, use our circumstances for good if we're called according to his purpose. So we can trust by faith that whatever we're going through, even the worst thing he can use to be the best thing. And that's how I pray sometimes because I've had some pretty heavy duty worst things, things that we don't expect. Uh, my younger son was stabbed at one point and almost was, he was almost murdered. And that was my prayer that God would use it, that worst thing for the best. And he did. And I've seen some wonderful things come about that would never have come about if we hadn't gone through that. I've seen that with friends with cancer. I've seen it in my own life with job loss. I lost my job with the scientists. I loved it, but I wouldn't have written my book if I hadn't lost that job. So, and that story's in the book as well. There's, it's an adventure when we're um, looking towards concepts that are true instead of what our culture says, oh, you need this, or you can do that, or you have to be beautiful. You have to be this, you know, God just takes who we are. He made us who we are, and he knows exactly what's going to satisfy our hearts. Well, and everyone's story has a different path, right? A different turn, you know, what might work for somebody else or, you know, 
and this is why I'd like to get different stories on tea time is because we all have a story to tell and we all walk down a different path, but your path is not wrong. And my path is not wrong. Those were the paths that we were given. And those are the choices that we needed to make. And, you know, getting married at a young age, I can, I can relate to that because I got married at 18 and I was forced into my marriage. And, mm. you know, so there was a lot of hard stuff. There was no love. There was no compassion there to begin with. You know, this was a forced engagement. Mm. And that's what, for your first marriage, Patty, did you know before you got married that it was not right? Or you were just hoping that it would change if you got married? I think it was an escape. Uh, again, that escaping the pain. I was in a lot of pain. I was, uh, I'd gone to college for a year. I didn't feel like I fit. I didn't feel like I fit anywhere. I didn't fit it my, with my mom. I didn't, I just didn't fit. And I think I thought if I had my own home, my own family, that it would solve my problems. I don't think there was real love there. I think it was just more of an escape. And I went right from the frying pan into the fire. I, it did not take long at all before I knew that it was not what I wanted. Um, and I didn't know, I would have fixed it if I could, but I couldn't. And sometimes we just can't fix things. I think the same thing held true in my second marriage is we both really tried um, but we were very different and it's, that's why I've been very careful about dating because I think, you know, being single in our culture is everybody's like, Oh, you need someone. Well, you know, we can have very satisfying, fulfilled lives as single people. If we're, um, walking in a way that. is true to who we are. I think it's when we try to be something for somebody else that we get into trouble. And I think that was partly what happened in both my marriages as I wanted certain things. I thought that was the pathway to get there. Like I said, if I hadn't been married to my second husband, I wouldn't be who I am now. We had many good years. They were hard. It was a hard marriage. We both tried to make it better and we just couldn't do it. And it, finally he divorced me. I had no, I, I, I told him I did not want a divorce. Uh, I wanted to make it work, but he maybe rightfully so decided it couldn't work and uh, divorced me. And he's been married now for about 10 years. And I, I hope he's happy. I want the best for him. He's well, still. And, the and that's what you want, right? When you love someone, you want the best for them, even if it means not being with you. Right. You know, I even uh, at one in the book, I say something about loving him more because I chose to love him every day. I learned how to choose love when I didn't feel it. And that's a very important component that changes us. It makes us more caring. This is where the social issues come in. It's often phrased as social justice. These three things are all very intertwined, self, sexuality, and social issues. Um, when we talk about social justice, what we're talking about is man's concept of that. And that changes depending on who's doing the talking. It's one reason there's so much of a divide in our country because there's no platform to stand on that's stable. It depends on who's in authority that makes the rules. And justice for one person doesn't look like justice for another person. But when you use a biblical standard that's always the same and God is the judge and we come to the place which is in, I think it's in the Bill of Rights about how all men are created equal. That means it doesn't matter what a person's uh, race, 
what their creed, what their sexual identity, whatever it is, you know, some things are behaviors, some things are innate in us. And it's the dignity of man that makes for true justice. We can't not care when we have a right identity in the creator and know that he loves other people just as much as he does us. That sets a stable platform from which everything else flows. A human trafficking victim might have known hundreds of men. She might have been beaten to a pulp, but she's just as valuable as the woman who lives in Beverly Hills and is on the big screen as a movie star. Um, George Floyd was every bit as important as uh, the man who killed him. And yes, God even cares about that man. You know, there's the dignity of man is what gives us all common ground and the behaviors change, but the behavior isn't our identity. It's just a behavior. And so when our beliefs get straightened out, then we behave on our beliefs. We treat each other right. So the identity, the sexuality, the social issues all come back to being made in God's image. So Patty, how did you get into the sex trafficking? Uh, you created a platform, correct? Right. I, that really was where I started getting involved in social issues. And from there it's branched out into a lot of different areas. But um, I, I heard about what was happening right here in California, in Los Angeles, which is about 30 miles away. It is a trafficking hub. I heard about it in my church and started uh, doing some research and started going to some of their um, seminars where they taught about it. And uh, the more I heard, the more appalled I was. And I just had to get involved because girls as young as 12 are, are caught into this lifestyle Girls like I was who care, who thought a man could solve her problems. And these pimps will entice girls by saying, I'll be your daddy. I'll take care of you. And I think the correlation with me and craving a man's attention really resonated with what some of these young girls go through. And I realized they are really victims. When you see prostitutes, when you see... And actually, I first became aware of that while I was with Jan. He kind of opened up my world in terms of not being so naive. Um, we, uh, he is the first one who pointed out a prostitute to me, and I was just shocked. I was appalled. And um, so that was the beginning of my understanding what this was and how tragic it is and how much people need our help. And as I got aware of that, I became aware of the foster care system and how most trafficking victims come out of foster care. They're looking for a family and that's what traffickers often promise them. And so I'm now uh, not as involved with trafficking, although one of the groups I still work with does have a home for uh, victims but it's a foster care um, nonprofit where I help with fundraising. Never expected to do that. But um, again, I, you know, I'm called according to a purpose. And that purpose is to help these young, young people, boys and girls, uh, have a family. And that's just been a real delight. And Patty, you just said something that really got me like my like it just blows me away is the foster care kids you know you never think of them as being trafficking uh you know i really want to look into that further i, I want to talk to you more about that because we need to get that information out there we need to get that awareness out there uh you know there's so many children that are in foster care and that are reaching the age limit of getting out and we need to give them some awareness that you know that people are out there looking for them that's exactly right. 
Miss Liz. You know, it is a travesty what happens to these children. And as they age out of the system, they often end up homeless. And while they're homeless, the traffickers are watching for them. And they will go to them and say, you can, I'll take care of you. You know, baby girl, I'm your guy. I'll take care of you. And quite often they take, well, one story that just really uh, grabbed my heart was these 12, 13 year old girls. I think there were two girls that were quote, quote, rescued by a pimp. And he took them to a truck stop and forced them to have sex with multiple truckers. Um, and they were just children. And yet it, the ones aging out, one of the things I like about the nonprofit I work with, and if you, if, if your listeners will go to my um, website, there's uh, testimonials on, uh, I think it's on my about page. And one of those is for Olive Crest. It's the nonprofit that I volunteer with. And they have a program where when a young person is aging out of the system, they will set that young person up in an apartment because they know what will happen if they don't help because the person doesn't have a family to help them with a place to live or with um, learning how to do interviews, learning how to get a job and manage money. And so Olive Crest works with them. They set them up in an apartment and they have to work and go, work and go to school, I believe, or one or the other. I think it's both, but at the, and they pay rent, but the rent's nominal. And at the end of a year, they get their rent money and their furniture and what they need to live on their own so that they're prepared as adults. In fact, we had at our fundraiser, we had a young woman come that is now at UCLA. She's a huge success story because of her foster care family. So there's many, many things that people can do to volunteer with foster care that don't involve necessarily taking a foster child into your home. I'm not equipped to do that. I've got too many of other things going on. I wanted to mentor young, young people, but that takes a big commitment to always be there. And I couldn't make that commitment either. So what I do is I help with fundraising and we, we put on a big fundraiser every year and make um, tens of thousands of dollars to support these programs. I think it's really important what you're doing, Patty, because like you said, you're not equipped to do it, but you're equipped to help in other areas. And this is where we all can make a difference is if we come and stand together and be, be a voice and say, you know what, I'm not equipped to do this, but maybe you are. And the next person, you know, and then work together and look at you making a difference by raising money and helping these children. Uh, I'm still blown away because I was in the foster care system growing up as a child. And, and my kids were put into foster care for, because of my situation with my ex-husband and I'm just blown away. I would have never, ever thought of foster children being targeted by traffickers. They, they, thank you for that information because I'm going to work my butt off to get that information out there because there are so many children in foster care homes that are aging out and are in this danger of getting trafficked. Uh, so thank you for bringing that awareness to the table today, Patty. I, like I said, I never know where these tea times go. Uh, my guests always surprise me, always give me something to work with and, and learn as well. So thank you for that, Patty. Um, and thank you for sharing your story today with all of us, because it really does make a difference. We need to start talking about the heavy topics as well, because it's a light topic, because it was a heavy topic. You wrote a book. And now you're at peace and you found yourself and you found your purpose in life. And that's through writing and sharing and being an incredible advocate and mentor for these children. So thank you for that. Like, I, I'm just blown away because I, I, I lived it and it, it's scary. It's really scary to hear that. Um, before we wrap up, Patty, I want to just put up the book again, and I want to just get into why you named this book The Windblown Girl, because oh. I'm really curious about the title. That's what really got me was the image and the title. I was just like, I need this book. And that's how I work, guys. I, it's books that they call me. Well, you know that The Windblown Girl has an interesting story. I was in the Caribbean with my mom, and I saw that Yadro figurine. And I thought, 
I, I knew there was some kind of bond between us, but I didn't know what it was. I had no idea. It just felt like this mystical bond. And even my mom felt it, which she was not very in tune with um, things like that at all. But she knew. And I couldn't afford her. She was way too expensive, but I just loved her. The, you know, the imagery that she presents really spoke to me. And I didn't know why. But a few years later, my mom surprised me with her at Christmas as a gift. And I didn't have a good place to put her. I was afraid she'd get broken. So I put her in the box up in my cupboard as high on the top shelf so my kids couldn't get to her. And so she was kind of hidden away. And then eventually we um, were able to uh, put in a china closet and I was able to put her behind the glass. And then after my family left, I put her on the mantle where she, where everybody could see her. And that's kind of my story is that um, I was pretty fragile uh, for a long time. And for a while, I didn't have what I needed to possess the person I could be, my true identity. And then when it started to emerge, I had to protect it because it was hard to make all the changes I had to make. And it was slow. And so um, it was this gradual, if you will, coming out of the closet where eventually I can stand tall and the windblown girl. Now, when I look at her, I've got a book here too. And well, I just read from it, but if you look at her, she is standing. How can I get it there? You, there you can go. see she's standing on a rock and the winds blowing really fierce against her. And I equate that to life's winds and she's holding a book behind her back. And I equate that to the Bible. And I think we really did have a tie in that I didn't even know. And now she's kind of my brand. I'm doing a logo right now that has the windblown girl. And I had to get permission to use her. And I think it's, it seemed impossible. I tried for about six months. I couldn't get permission and I couldn't use her without permission, even a photograph, because I didn't want to end up with a lawsuit. My designer told me, you've got to try one more time. So I, contacted corporate headquarters in Spain. I ended up getting to the right person and they gave me blanket permission to use her any way I want. So she's kind of my imagery about we're all faced with life's winds that blow against us, whatever it might be. And we can all stand firm on our convictions when we know our true identity. I, I, I just love the book. Like that's why I got the book. Like I said, it was in my wish list, in my wish card for almost two years. And I was just like, I just need it because I just feel like this title and the cover speaks to me. It's that girl looking out to the ocean. And I always go to the water when I need to reflect on life. And, you know, and when I need to straighten my tea, I go to the water. And when I seen the image of your book, Patty, I was just like, I need this book. And anybody that knows Miss Liz's story, that's how I started writing was because of a book mm -hmm. by, by an author, Brenda Hammond. And her book, it was just speaking to me. And Patty, your book has been speaking to me and it, it just pulls me in. And it says, look at the strength within this girl. The wind is blowing and she's still standing. And it's like you said, the life of wind, right? We all have something that we've had to overcome. And it just blows me away on uh, on the cover like the cover i could just look at the cover all day long because it's so beautiful um so i can't wait to see where you're gonna go next with your next set of books and series and all of that but we're gonna get get that out there when they come out for everybody out there so what final message would you like to leave everybody with patty i think the message i'd most like to give is that we're not alone that no matter how lonely we feel, whether we're married or not, whether we're uh, rich or poor, whatever state we're in, we're not alone. That there is a God who loves us, that we're precious to him, and that when we look to him for our identity, that we can find peace and security that transcends our circumstances. And I think that's what we all want, is I think we want 
to have that peace inside, to know what we believe and to not have uh, the winds blowing us like a tumbleweed. So I, I think that's, uh, that's my most important message is that you are precious, you are loved and you're not alone. Well, thank you so much. It was a pleasure having you here and finally getting to meet you face to face through the virtual and maybe one day in person. Uh, I'm working on getting to know all my guests in person. That's one of my goals, my bucket list out there. But I want to thank all the listeners out there as well. Thank you, Bruce, for your comment and for tuning in. I always appreciate your support as well. Uh, thank you for all the listeners on Instagram and your support as well. I really appreciate that. Uh, we will be back on the 20th with a returning guest. Pepper Ann will be back in the house and she'll be talking about her updates uh, about her book and that she was on last year. And we're just going to do some updates and have some good old tea time for a second time and get a little wild with her book. And then we'll be back on the 22nd and we'll have another two TAs as well. So stay tuned for that. And the press release for September's guest will be out on the 24th of August. So stay tuned for all of that. You'll see some incredible guests. And we have some new countries that will be joining Miss Liz. So I'm super excited for that as well. Until then, keep serving your tea, keep being true to yourself, and let's make a difference with real life stories and words with TEA with Miss Liz. <laughs>